Gracias. Hola, mi gente desde South America, y Uruguay, y Argentina, y Brasil, ¿sí? ¿Y Perú? No, ok. Me llamo Tal Resedek. Vivo en los Estados Unidos. Hey. Soy americano. Sí, ok. No, en Colorado, esto es Colorado. Ok. Jorge already said all this, except for Father of Four. Mi padre es Four Niños. Uh, cuatro Niños. Chiquilines? I don't know that. Okay. Okay. Uh, uno niña, tres niños, es uh, seis años, ocho años, y diez años. Uh, twins. They say twins. Emelos? Okay. That's them. Oh, okay. I'll show you again. <laughs> Ok, I work for, yo trabajo, yo trabajando es uh, Jack Pocket, uh, Jack Pocket, ok, that's in English, Re you can read that, ok, it's to play the lottery. Ok, the talk is building a consumer ready product with nerves. Ok, why? That's the end of my Spanish, by the way. It's all English. Ok, why make a hardware device? Okay, so this is a quote that I, I read recently from this book from Tony Fadell, the founder of Nest. He said, electrons are nothing without atoms. So as programmers, we do things in electrons all day, and then we turn off the computer and it's gone. Um, you build things in hardware, it's still there. So the other reason, so some problems require compl complex solutions. So needs to be connected, so it needs to physically be connected to something else. Uh, you need a physical UI, you need something tactical, switches, buttons, etc. cetera. Um, or it needs to connect some software with some hardware, interop. So these, these are reasons why you'd make a hardware solution. So like what? What are some examples of some hardware solutions to some real world problems? I'm sure you've seen some, but here's one that I made called Drizzle 2000. Uh, has anybody seen this before? Oh, I Just for you watching at home, it's like 2,000 people here. Almost everybody raised their hand. Okay, so this is for controlling sprinklers um, for, for my house. So I made this out of nerves. Uh, stall monitor. Um, it's what it looks like. So, okay, here's the story. So I, worked, I work for a company that has uh, 100 men. So... Uh, 100 men, my boss decided how many bathroom stalls should we put in this new office, and he decided the answer was one. Um, uno, uno baño uh, para uh, 100. Ciento, ciento hombres. Uh, uh, apre, apre, is that after? Antes. Antes de segundo, the queue is no, no good. Okay. So, this is an IoT device that would tell you when the bathroom was being used or not used, so you didn't have to leave your desk. Um, okay, so here's one that I didn't make called Petivity, and it's got a cat, and um, so this is an IoT device, and it's very fancy, it has an app, and it will tell you everything, uh, including um, every time your cat went to the litter box, if it went poo-poo or pee-pee, or if it just did nothing. Um, so, and this is a real product that exists. So this guy at a $300 billion company in the U.S. asked, you know, his team of engineers, can we make a device that tracks when your cat goes poop? That's a product, okay? So that's what we're talking about when you say, like, oh, should I build a hardware product? That might be too dumb. No, it's not too dumb. Th th this exists. Okay, so, so what problem am I trying to solve? Why am I building something out of hardware? This is the problem. <laughs> I, I saw solutions for cat poop, but I didn't see anything for dogs. So can I make a device that tracks when your dog goes poop? <laughs> okay, not really. That's not really what I made. But that's, a, that's not a bad idea either. Okay, 
Um, the problem, routers. So uh, we all have internet routers at home, routers and, and switches, modems. Um, and the problem is sometimes your router gets slow or it stops working and you need to go turn it off, turn it back on. Um, and so the problem is, so they slow down. Sometimes you get latency. Network can degrade. You lose packets. And it's often your router is in some faraway place where you don't see it, so it, location issues. Um, and a lot of what happens in routers, this is an aside, is actually due to the memory. So routers used to have very little memory in them, and so the cache would refresh very frequently, and so it wouldn't need to be reset as often. Later on, like in the last 10 years or so, um, memory, the makers of memory chips don't make small memory anymore. You can't buy one gigabyte or, sorry, 512 megabytes of memory anymore. You have to get huge memory. So the caches last a lot longer. So unfortunately, you have to turn it off, turn it back on to recycle the cache. Um, so that's what you, you have to do with new routers. So I'm trying to find a solution for that. So the requirements are it has to connect to the network. So networks have times where they're degraded. It has to have some indicator. So can I look at it? Can I just take a one look at it and see if my network is good or bad? And it has to control the power. So can it turn off and turn back on the router? Um, OK, question two, why use nerves? OK, first question, why not use nerves? OK, so this is. Probably a better place to start is why wouldn't you want to use nerves for your hardware product? Um, so nerves requires a small board computer and basically can run on anything that can run Linux or even a small version of Linux. Um, unfortunately, if you look at the like the uh, computer on the bottom, that's a 2240, um, which is a, a smaller chip that runs much slower and that cannot run. Linux on it. Um, the device on the top is a Raspberry Pi, which some of us probably have sitting around. And it's much more powerful, but it takes a lot more power. So you can't really run it on a battery. It costs a lot more. Physically, it's larger. Um, and right now, availability is pretty low. So if you wanted to buy one or five of Raspberry Pis, right now it's going to be very hard. So that's one reason why you wouldn't, or those are the reasons why you might not want to start a project in NERVS and would build it in C or Arduino or some other technology first. Um, now let's talk about all the reasons why you do want to use NERVS to build your product. So one is stability. Um, NERVS runs on the beam. We Hopefully this is an Elixir conference. Hopefully everybody here appreciates the stability of beam. Um, We've heard the stories of like the original Beam products, the switches in Northern Europe that have nine nines of availability. Um, you get the same same stability on your IoT device. Nine nine nine, as it goes off the screen. Um, security. So Nerves runs on a small version of Linux. Um, the good news, like the the reason that's secure is you have fewer packages being brought in means a lower vector for, for um, uh, security vulnerabilities. So it's just a really small subset of what you need to run Linux, um, which should make it maybe more secure than other platforms. Um, it's it's build root derived Linux. So if you look up build root, you can kind of see more of, a, more of what that means. Versatility. So with Beam systems, you can use other languages. So some of us maybe have used uh, Rustler or Rust. Anybody raise your hand if you use Rust? OK. So you know that. So if you want to uh, optimize, yeah, OK. So if you want to optimize your program and, and, and run some routines in Rust, you can. But you can also call out to Python. You can write things in C uh, or Zig, for instance. So Beam is really versatile. It doesn't. Starting with nerves doesn't mean you're writing everything in Elixir or everything in Erlang. Uh, it could mean writing a lot of things in Zig um, as well. And then 
Elixir and Erlang. So we all know, you know, how nice it is to program in Elixir and Erlang. And um, I don't know if anyone's done any C programming before, but it's it's okay. But it's not as good as I don't know. I don't enjoy it as much as I like programming in Erlang. Um, so that's a good reason to to uh, use Nerves. Durability. Um, this represents the supervision tree. So this I really like about the way the Beam runs is you can have all these different functions on your IoT device, and if one of them is having problems, it doesn't crash the whole system. Um, and in fact, it will try to restart itself without you intervening. Um, for an IoT device, that can be really important because oftentimes you're installing them in faraway places um, or hard to get at places, and you don't, it's not practical or sometimes even possible to go in there and reset everything. Um, so having the having the runtime or the yeah having the beam runtime restart something for you saves you a lot of trouble. And finally, Live View. Uh, so if you want to make an interface for your IoT product, you can run Live View on Nerves, um, which is really convenient and gives you opportunity to run a really really nice looking UI um, with the system that you which the system that you have. Okay, um, so let's maybe get into some details. This is the product that I built. Applause. Okay. okay. It's always better when I don't have to say that, but <laughs> whatever. Okay, so this is Bolt. Uh, so this is my solution to my router problems. Um, and this is what, what Bolt looks like on the inside. So well, let, me, let me just describe Bolt for you just for a second. So I wanted it to look fun uh, and not intimidating. Hopefully it looks like a little robot to you with kind of floppy arms. Okay, so that's why I made it that way and he's got these three lights on the top which indicate your network status and kind of look like eyeballs. Um, okay, so this is what's inside Bolt. So when you're, when you're building a hardware product um, this is probably one of the first things you're going to do is, is build a wiring diagram and make a schematic of all the parts that you need. And so for me, I started with the Raspberry Pi Zero. Um, the thing on the top left is a relay, and then other, uh, the other devices are just the LED lights. So this is really all that's inside of, of Bolt are these three things. Um, so. The requirements, again, it's got to check the network. It's got to have some indicator of uh, when there's problems, and it's got to be able to turn off and on the power. So um, let's look at, at just the supervision tree, essentially, to get started. So when the app starts up, we run these four things, so ping server, the reset server, uh, GPIO, and data, and these are Basically, these are all gen servers that are running as children. Um, so for, let's talk about the first um, solution that we need to, to find, which is an indicator, some way to show us what the status of the light or status of the network is. And that's done with these LED indicators. Uh, LEDs are just binary, so they're either on or off. Um, so you give them voltage, you don't give them voltage. That sets the state on those. And uh, for nerves, uh, this is how you work with LEDs or most GPIO, in fact. So this, um, this gen server is GPIO. It's, you saw it in the application file that started up when the app starts. And um, in, in nerves, uh, there's a library called circuits. And what this does is, is when it init's the gen server, it just establishes a connection and says, okay, the red, pin is this number and its initial value is zero, so it's off. Uh, then we have a yellow at this location, a green at this location. Um, this also initializes the relay that I showed you. So it just sets up the connections to say, hey, this device is on this GPIO, uh, GPIO pin on the Raspberry Pi. Um, so just to be clear, like where all those wires terminate, those 40 dots up there, those are the GPIOs, or most of them at least are GPIOs. 
So it's just saying, oh, the red one is at 18 and the yellow one is at 19. Um, that's what that code does. And so to manage that state, we've got uh, four different statuses, basically. So we've got an alert status, which says light up the red. We've got a warning status, which says light up the yellow. We've got an OK status, which lights up the green light. And then we've got an unknown status, which lights up all three. All right, so that's the indicator. So the problem was, can I see at a glance when the network is having problems? That's what display does, um, uses those LEDs. Okay, on to the next one, which is the power. We've got this um, AC relay. This is what it looks like in real life. And this is to switch, um, well, in the US, this is 110 volts. In Uruguay, it might be 220, Two, okay. So, so don't buy this one in Uruguay. <laughs> um, so, but in the US, we use 110 volts. So all the, what this does is, is switches that on and off. This is the dangerous part. I want to make sure you're aware of that. This is, so that's actually okay. This is much worse. And that, that's, this is a very bad day. So be, be really careful when you're dealing with, um, with AC current, uh, 110 volts, 220 volts. It, it could kill you, but it will definitely hurt you uh, if you mess around with it. So, um, so you have to be careful with that. The relay, so it, this is the code basically for the, for the relay to reset. Um, and again, this gets started up when the application starts. The, uh, there's a, a gen server that runs. So in my case, I have my, um, my router set to restart once per day, um, which it may be good, may be bad, but instead of waiting until it has a problem, um, I have mine set up so that at uh, 4 a.m. Um, it will restart the, will cycle the power on the router. So the good news is that cleans the memory every day. The bad news is you get a new IP address every day. So if your corporate like uh, allow list has your IP in it, it only lasts for one day and you have to give them your new IP. So keep that in mind. Um, and that's what this does. It just basically runs um, every hour, um, the set, send interval runs once an hour and it just checks, are we in the four o'clock hour? And if so, then we restart. Uh, so sometimes it's at four o'clock, sometimes it's at 4.01, you know, whatever. I'm asleep usually. Um, so, okay, insert Argentinian joke. So at 4 a.m., I'm asleep. You're just starting to eat dinner uh, in Argentina. I'm sleeping, so. You might want to set yours to later. Okay. Good Argentinian joke. Was that okay? Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. So this is the this is the ping server. So um, the code for starting up. Uh, so cycle. Sorry th for start for cycling the power is power off function, which you can see writes to that uh, relay and turns it on. So uh, relays have a normally on and a normally, normally open and a normally closed setting. And so this one is opening the setting, um, which is opening the circuit. So it's taking power away. Um, and then it waits for 15 seconds and then it turns it back on, closes the circuit again. So that's what we're doing for cycling power is, is turning the relay off essentially, waiting 15 seconds, then turning it back on. Um, and this, I don't know, this little code, this very, very short bit of code is, um, I don't know, I just, I like the way it looks in Elixir. It's, uh, it's really clean to send this command, then wait, then send another command. Okay. Uh, why, why you in, in seconds? Is there a reason for waiting? No, no reason for, the question was why wait 15 seconds? Fif for, for my router, 15 seconds seems to be long enough to cycle the power. Um, it could be 60 seconds, could be 90 seconds. It's not, yeah, scientific at all. Um, I wouldn't do it for one second. I would, you know, wait a little longer than that. So, uh, okay, so we've got the indicators. We know when the, where the network status is. We've got the power. Essentially, we're turning it off, turning it back on. And now we need to 
<coughs> check the network. So, all right. First of many problems, uh, this, is, this is really the hard part. So up to now, we've had binaries. So off and on, turn the light off, turn the light on. Turn the relay off, turn the light relay on. Now we're getting into the more complicated things um, on the network. So the first thing we need to learn about is this multicast DNS. Uh, MDNS is, just think of it as a DNS server that just runs locally. Uh, so it gives you a local address. It, you can access it when you're on that network. When you're off that network, you won't have access to it. Um, so it essentially just says, give this name to this, um, this device that has a local IP. So that, that's the way you think about that. And um, the NERVS ecosystem has um, a tool for that uh, called VintageNet, which is um, it's designed to sort of handle setting up Wi-Fi connections. Um, and using MDNS to do that. So this is what it looks like. Basically, when you plug in Bolt, you'll get this local address, which is bolt.local. Um, that's a, dot .local is a convention in MDNS. You don't have to use dot .local, but it's just a convention. Um, excuse me. So when you turn it on, uh, VintageNet goes into its wizard mode, which is an AP mode. So if you've ever used uh, Chromecast, for instance, you plug it in, it actually becomes its own Wi-Fi hotspot, and you say, okay, connect my Wi-Fi to this device instead of my router. Um, so it's in, uh, so it's, that's AP mode, and so it's, um, uh, that's the same thing that VintageNet does. And so by using the VintageNet library, you can do that with Bolt. So you plug Bolt in and connect to bolt.local, and then essentially it's kind of relaying Okay, these are the Wi-Fi networks that I see. Uh, and so this is what it looks like, um, or this is what it can look like, I should say. There's a, this is a bit of customization to get the UI to look like this, although it doesn't look that much different um, right out of the box. So, uh, so yeah, so you plug Bolt in, it goes into this mode, you then go through there, uh, through the web interface, bolt.local, pick your, your um, local Wi-Fi that you wanted to connect to and enter the security credentials and you're all set up. Uh, this is the live view, the UI. So you don't have to ever look at this. Um, I mean, Bolt is designed to just kind of manage itself, see if, you know, when the network's down, it restarts. Um, but if you're really interested in to see what your network is doing, this is a, this is actually a, a screen capture from my network. Um, and you can kind of see, so the yellow is the ping times, and I'll show you how and what we're pinging in a minute, but so they, they go from like virtually zero uh, most of the time all the way up to about 100 milliseconds at the worst case scenario. And then in the orange, you can see packet loss. So it just looks like one, two, three, four, five times, five times in that span, um, which covers a few days, um, it has lost, looks like one packet essentially. So between 25 and 50% packet loss. Um, and then as you scroll down, you can see every single timestamp of when it did that ping and, and what happened. So if you had like a really bad network, I guess this might be useful to diagnose, hey, at this time of day, you know, everything goes crazy. And then you may set up your automatic uh, restarts to happen closer to that time instead of at 4 a.m., for instance. Um, but also it just kind of looks cool, I think. So um, this is a little bit of that code. This is the ping server. So the ping server is um, using fping. Um, and fping is a tool. Well, I'll get to that in a second. So essentially it's just a gen server. It says start up, run at this this period, so for me, mine runs every 90 seconds. Um, this pattern at the top on line two, you can see is, uh, well, I'll show you why I need that, but that's basically fping what it returns to you, so it's able to um, pattern match that. So this is the thing that actually does the ping, so the system command fping, um, and it pings three times, and the address it pings is 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. uh, does anybody recognize that? 
Yeah, it's Google's DNS. Okay, so why Google's DNS? Because it's probably very reliable. So if you ping um, Twitter or something, then you'll be like, oh, my network's really effed up right now. But no, it's really Twitter that's, that's messed up. So I figured Google is pretty reliable. It's going to give me pretty good responses. There's also 1.1.1.1, uh, which is, uh, what is it? Cloudflare. Yeah, Cloudflare is DNS, which is another good one to use. Um, and I don't think they care about my pings every 90 seconds. They're probably not picking up on that. So, um, so this is what it does. So we system command. So it's, this is calling out to Linux, really. Um, it says, run this fping. Now, fping, I had to compile into um, my NERV system because it wasn't included. There, when I built Bolt, which was a couple years ago now, um, Linux or NERVs did not have an ICMP, an actual ICMP ping built into the system. Um, and so that's why I added fping. It's actually built into NERVs now, so you wouldn't have to call fping. You can use the NERVs native tools, which is in NERVs toolbox. Uh, to do an actual ICMP ping. Um, so yeah, it calls out to that, uh, parses the response, which is using that pattern um, that I set here, and calculates the results, call, writes it out to the display, it stores the data, that's how we build that graph in live view, and then maybe restart, meaning that if we met certain conditions, let's restart, um, restart Bolt. So, this is calculate results. So, um, so yeah, I mean, basically what this does is takes all the, the rows that we got back. So we are pinging three times and we're just reducing over that row or, or over that data and creating a percentage essentially um, saying over those three attempts, uh, we had this number of packets lost on average and it, the ping took this amount of time. <coughs> uh, parse response here. So uh, this is the first thing actually that it does, which is um, just takes the response from fping and uses that pattern and to sort of make a data structure out of it and uses the regex named captures. Has anybody used that before? It's pretty cool. So um, it just assigns names essentially to, let me look at that. So the pattern, so that, uh, brackets time brackets, that's actually the name for that capture group. So that first group that's in the parentheses um, is actually called time in a struct. And then the next, the last one is called loss in the struct. And so that's what regex named captures does. Um, and then let's see, we go back to the display. So the, the light up function is pattern matching on, on the data that we just got from the ping and says, okay, if in the case that we got an alert back, do this, warning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it'll show you the right lights. Um, and then the status is the pack has to do, well, the status looks at both the packet loss and the uh, latency. And, um, and so it pattern matches on that. So in this case, the first head on line 16 says, oh, we have 100% packet loss, we're in alert mode. Um, if the packet loss is greater than zero, go into warning mode. Um, and then the next line is, if the time is greater than 2,500 milliseconds, um, which is an arbitrary number, we go into warning. And um, otherwise, we go into, or if we got zero attempts back, meaning just fping just did not work, we go into unknown and then otherwise everything's okay. So these are sort of the, the um, different states that we need to be aware of. And maybe restart is here. So again, if it pattern matches on 100% packet loss, it will automatically cycle the power. All right. So this is, um, I think this product could use some AI, which this is really what AI is going to be in a NERVS product, like just a heuristic essentially. As, and, and that's kind of what it has now is like, oh, if packet loss is this, oh, if uh, latency is this, you know, then do these certain things. I think it would be kind of cool to add AI to it to say, 
oh, your network is not that great, right? So let's not be so finicky. If it goes up to 2,500 milliseconds, that's actually sort of normal for you. So let's just wait until it goes above what's normal. Um, so my numbers are all sort of magic numbers, the 15 second restarts, the 2,500 milliseconds. Um, those are all sort of arbitrary based on my network. So I think AI would be, or this complicated conditional would be kind of cool so that it could learn a little bit about your network. And um, honestly, with the tools that we have in Elixir and then any, if you wanted to reach out to Python, it probably wouldn't be that hard um, to add that. So uh, what is this? Oh, this is the data. So there's a gen server that stores the data, um, again, for that graph. And um, one of the properties of this data is that, like, I just don't want to hold on to it forever. So I keep a, a, a max length, essentially, of that, that stack. So it just says, OK, if you've gotten to this length, then um, just delete the first thing and just do a, a FIFO sort of a, a stack with the data. So if you look at it throughout the day, it sort of the data will sort of move from right to left. Um, all right, so I think I met all the requirements for, for that. So we've checked the network. We've given some indication as to when the, the conditions are bad or if they're good. And we've managed to plug and unplug the thing. Um, the next thing is to build that UI. And that's another thing I really like about NERVS is the idea of this poncho project. So has anybody used a poncho project before or an umbrella? Umbrellas, okay, I'm sorry. And uh, so a poncho project is sort of taken off the idea of an umbrella project, although really what it is is just keeping your projects next to each other in the file system. They really don't have anything to do with each other. So um, Bolt UI is, so Bolt firmware is, is the NERVS program. Bolt UI is the Phoenix program. Um, and so that's what builds this index page, for instance. And this line graph, there's a zoomed in view. So you can just kind of see how many data points there are. So um, I mean, just that little section is just, I don't know how many data points that is, probably 60. And so that's built with this SVG. So all, that's all that is, building this, is um, just an SVG box with some labels, text labels on the side. And then we make a line with the, the data loss, and we make a line for the pings. Um, so this is really, this is all you need to make a line graph in uh, Live View. All right, <clears throat> so I've done all that. I've done the hardware. I've done the UI. So this is the point at which you are, you say, somebody says, hey, how's Bolt coming along? You say, oh, I'm 80% done. I'm like 80%, which is good. Your project manager at work, how, far, how, how, how much of this have you gotten done? We're like 80%. So as you know, as an engineer, <laughs> this is how the math really looks. This is what a manager sees. This is what we think of. So you get the 80% done, which means you only have 80% left to do. Um, OK, so dot, dot, dot. What are the ideas? Like, what else is there to do? Um, when you're building a consumer-ready product, you've got all this little stuff. Packaging design, OK? So we've got to ship it in something. We've, maybe we're going to a retailer. We need to design a package for that. So you need to hire a designer or design something yourself, figure out where to get the box from, what is it supposed to look like, what information is supposed to be on this box. Um, I would say, uh, again, if you're interested in this stuff, that book that's called Build by Tony Fadell, uh, from Nest, he talks about all this stuff. Uh, like, do you know Nest, like the thermostats? Yeah, okay, I don't know if they're popular here. Um, he talks about all that stuff of how do we want the package to look? What size do we want on it? What text do we want on it? How big should the text be? There's all that work that goes into packaging design. Um, if you are selling in the US, or, or yeah, if you're selling in the US, you probably want to get a patent or a trademark on your product. Um, which is complicated. Uh, so the US Patent and Trademark Office, has anybody worked with the Patent Office before besides me? It's very complicated. OK. Did I see a hand? Yeah. OK. Good for you, man. Um, <laughs> but it's important. You want to patent your item, right? You don't want to make Bolt and then find it on Amazon called something else in you know two months. Uh, after you spent two years building it. So you've got to trademark it. 
So in the US, we've got three different kinds of patents. We've got utility patents, which are uh, you're patenting the functionality of it. Um, you've got design patents, which are you know aesthetic. How does it look? And then we've got this third kind, which is interesting. I didn't know about it until recently, which is for plants. So you can patent a plant. That's the last we'll talk about that. We don't need to. <laughs> OK, so if you're going to file for a patent, um, you need to actually submit an ink drawing of the product. So this is for a design patent. So as part of the application process, we've got all these tools nowadays, 3D renderings like I showed you, CAD tools, you know, CNC, all this modeling, everything. And they, but they require this. So they, an India ink line drawing is what's required. So if you look um, at the US Patent and Trademark Office website and you just search for different products, um, everything that has a design patent on it is going to somewhere in there have a drawing that looks like this. Uh, it's absolutely ridiculous, but it's a 170-year-old um, system, and Ben Franklin, you know, was drawing shit with India ink, and they're like, well, we just got to keep doing this. Uh, so you need a drawing with actual ink. Uh, so. If, if you're curious how I got this, like I, I just held a piece of paper up on my monitor and then like traced it. <laughs> that, that's fine. Okay, um, next thing, UL certification. So underwriters, laboratories, there might be others that do this certification, but essentially what you wanna do is make sure that you certify your product so that it's not gonna start on fire, not gonna kill anybody, um, and that you know it's ba generally safe. And so this involves um, giving them a lot of money, sending them your products, and then having them test it for weeks or probably months to let you know, yes, it's good, or no, it's not good. Um, but this is still an important part of it. I think if you're working with just low voltage, maybe not such a huge deal. For me, like working with, with line voltage from, from the house, a little bit be better of a deal um, just to indemnify yourself Make sure somebody besides you has looked at it and says, okay, this is probably safe. Um, and then this is from, this is boring. This is from ul.com. But essentially, yeah, it's just to make sure everything's safe. All right, then you've got to go into this larger scale manufacturing. So for the prototype, you can use a 3D printer. Um, and that's actually a really good idea. So either at home or somewhere else, just 3D print it, make a change. It's really cheap and really fast to do that, but when you're gonna create 1,000 or 5,000 of these items, 3D printing is not necessarily the fastest or most efficient way to go. So then you have to decide, how do I wanna build this? Um, there's injection molding, which is pretty common if you wanna build it out of plastic. CNC milled, if you wanna build it out of metal, which I think is probably pretty cool, or some other additive process, which is um, essentially like 3D printing, but you can use a lot of different materials in additive processes. And so you find uh, a vendor that can help you with that. Um, here's a couple that I know of, that one of which I've used. Uh, Fast Radius used to do some things in Elixir. I'm not sure if they still do or not. Um, they're based in the US. Um, and so you can send them your designs and they could manufacture 5,000 of those bolt cases for you. All right, and that's it. Preguntas. We have time? Okay. On the pregunta? Do you have bolts here? I don't have, sorry, I don't have bolts here. Um, he's working at home right now. <laughs> also, I wasn't sure about going through customs with a little robot. I thought, yeah, I thought it might be a bad idea. Okay, so uh, I did not bring bolt with me. I hope the pictures serve you. I, that's the best I can do, but he's he's small. He's about four inches tall. Um, four inches, what? Twelve centimeters? Ten? Ten? Yeah. Okay. Ten centimeters tall. He's pretty small. Okay. Preguntas? Is the installation of FPing part of the NERFS project also? 
so FPing is, so I, I mentioned that um, ICMP pinging is available on the NERVS based system now, so you wouldn't have to compile it separately. FPing, that specific tool, um, requires a custom NERVS system, so um, I, I didn't want to go into how to build that, but there's a fairly easy way to build a custom NERVS system. It's important to know not just for, I guess that's a good question, it's important to know not just for FPing, but if there are any other Linux uh, libraries that you want compiled in for things that you want to do, let's say in Python or something else, um, you can build a custom NERVS system or using build root essentially. Just go in and say, you know, add, flip these switches, turn this on the, in the kernel, turn this off, etc. Um, so I, does that answer the question? Okay. Hi. Um, did you feel, um, as a developer, any difference between a common Elixir project and building nerves, building boat? Um, did I feel any difference between, like a normal Phoenix project? Yeah. And, um, that's a good question. So I think I am used to, okay, so not really. Um, essentially, it's a lot of gen servers under the hood. So I think that's that's part of it. Um, I, it's a good question. So I, I've built hardware products in other languages and frameworks before. So some of it might have just been knowledge that I already had that it didn't seem complicated. Um, I also like as part of the hex team, I mostly work on the CLI. And so building like eScripts and CLIs is comfortable for me. So I guess, yeah, I can't, I can't say it was a big change for me because just I'm used to working kind of around the edges of, of the Elixir ecosystem already. Um, but essentially I think it's good to know some of the fundamentals of electronics um, and just the physics behind it uh, to start out with. And other than that, it's just a different way of thinking of like m passing the state around is, is, you know, I'm passing this state to a binary thing, which is just turning on a, a light essentially. Um, but yeah, mostly it's just gen servers. So I think it's very, very common, like OTP stuff, maybe not like Phoenix. Um, I mean, there's no Phoenix really involved in it, but otherwise, yeah, this is more, more OTP. Hopefully that answered the question. Okay. Uh, one, uh, one more from here. Oh, see. Uh, you, you talk about uh, having availability issues with the hardware uh, at the beginning. Uh, did you use, do you end up using Raspberry Pis for the final product, the commercial product? Um, yeah, so the commercial product is not on the commercial market yet. So, okay, that's a good question. So Raspberry Pis for prototyping, perfect. In a normal five years ago, if you were going to build 200 of these, like a Kickstarter, Raspberry Pis, perfect. Um, once you get to a certain point, you should really talk about a custom PCB. Um, so not just, yeah, well, some of it will be for cost, some of it will, will be for size, uh, and some of it would just be availability. So um, the Raspberry Pi, <coughs> excuse me, is a small board computer. It does a lot of things. Like it has Bluetooth, for instance. Do I need Bluetooth? No. Like I could take that chip off of the design. It has 40 GPIOs. Well, 26 GPIOs and then some ground and other things. Um, I'm not using the I squared C, bless you. I'm not using the I squared C bus. I, I don't need to have that on there, for instance. I don't need all those GPIOs. I only need a few of them. Um, so custom uh, PCB, I could get rid of those, save the processor, because that's what it's built for. Um, so that would, when you're looking to scale up manufacturing, then yeah, you probably want to just take the prototype to somebody um, like Frank Hunlith or somebody else and say, like, here's what it does. Here are the parts of the pie that I need. And they'll say, okay, here's, this is the processor. We can source that pretty easily and then draw up a new board. Um, so I haven't gotten, I haven't gotten that far yet. Uh, okay, I was going to ask because uh, you have to get something that works with NERVs, uh, and that should be pretty specific, more more or less. Yeah. Um, yeah. So NERVs will run on anything that can run Linux. Mm -hmm. So it's um, uh, 
So it's, it's not as hard as you think it is. Uh, for instance, like we had the new Mango Pi came out uh, this year. I don't know if anybody's seen that, but it's another small board computer. It sort of looks like the Pi Zero, um, but that run, runs on the RISC-V architecture. So totally different architecture. Um, but uh, Frank and the NERVS team were able to get NERVS running on that pretty quickly. Um, so as long as it can, as long as the processor can support build root, you can build NERVS on it. Um, it'd just be a little bit harder. Um, but you don't, you don't need these hardware devices. It's just these hardware devices um, are supported out of the box. I th awesome. Thank you. Okay. We good? No. Oh, Gabriel. Hey, mi amigo. Hey. Um, so we usually build software, and uh, most of the time we write tests, right? And uh, when you're working with just software that in most of the time interacts with other software, you know what that you can create like a good uh, test suite, right? Uh, how do you feel like uh, building uh, hardware? Uh, and uh, how do you feel comfortable like testing this? Because it's, it's to create the environment for testing this is much more complicated, right? So how confident you are when you build hardware and uh, how you test it? Okay. If you don't know Gabriel, he's, um this is a trick question. He already knows the answer to this question. So this is a trap. Okay, so it's a good question. So for, for testing hardware, first of all, when you're programming on your local machine, it's different than the program that's actually compiled to run on the device. Um, and so you're using a lot of mocks to say like, instead, when you send this, this high level, to this light, for instance. I don't actually have a light on my computer that's gonna light up. Do this other thing instead and make sure that that happened. So a lot of mocking of those interfaces. Um, testing, you can still test a lot of the logic because under the hood, you know, gen servers is just make sure state goes from this to this given this condition. Um, as far as testing, so in this case, the input is networking, network conditions. So I think it's fairly simple to build a, a mock of those. Um, in other scenarios where there might be millions of permutations, I don't know, did Andrea show up? He knows about property testing. It may be a good solution for property testing. Um, thank you for asking, Gabrielle. <laughs> okay. Testing is really hard for hardware items. A lot of times it's actually plug this thing in do something weird, see if it happens, or SSH into it, make it do this thing. Um, that's the best answer I can give. I don't, I, I talk to a lot of people in NERVS, and I don't think anybody ha ever says like, oh yeah, we've got it down. We've got testing down. It's, we know exactly how to do it. So thank you for the trap question. <laughs> Okay. Muchas gracias, mis nuevos amigos y amigas.